And she explained that that was my, I was so, I told my brain that we were going to the South Pole. So my mind was just making stuff up. So my mind to me, that is scabbing and it's getting better. And that's absolute nonsense. Like if you look at the picture, it's clearly not that. Um, and I, I, was, I was just getting there no matter what. You, you had had your first ex- expedition to the South Pole, um, which hadn't gone to plan. You'd got back and your determination to go out for the second attempt was, what, nine months, eight months? Yeah, eight months away. Um, I, pre- I knew on the plane home that I was going back. Um, yeah. I wanted to wait a couple of months before making the decision because I was worried it was just tied up in feeling like such a failure. Like I remember even in hospital, my phone was on airplane mode in London. I didn't want to deal with anyone. I wasn't ready to you know, speak to anyone just yet. I thought, oh, I'll be safe reading the Metro paper. And I opened the Metro paper and there's a like, second page is a picture of me and it says, um, London lawyer in the South Pole failure. <laughs> My God. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> get rid of that. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to make sure my, my, my why for going back was, you know, the same as it had been the first time or maybe even better. Um, and then also it's quite a big decision to go back. You get all that money together again. Um, and I also think for me it was a joint decision with Matt and I um, because it could be quite a selfish undertaking doing expeditions like this. Like your whole life for the next nine months again would be about me in Antarctica. There's interviews to do, there's press stuff to do, there's filming for a documentary to do. Um, every free time we, all the free time we have together is, is, is focused on me and my training. So the weekends are, you know, where are we going in the lakes this weekend so that I can train? Um, and he's never once why he's fully supported with a lot of similar things himself but still it's not something to be taken advantage of I don't think I, I thought it was a lot to ask um, and Matt was like yeah sure so, so <laughs> it wasn't that big a deal after all um, and then the other the other factor to take into account was um, I promised work I promised the board of the company that I where I worked that I would um, and my first trip to Antarctica was the last major expedition I'd be doing a major in terms of the amount of time I needed off work, which was about eight eight weeks. And um, I said after that, you know, I'll um, I'll, everything I do will be a normal annual leave. There'll be nothing mental. Don't worry. That was my like verbal promise. And so uh, yeah, asking for that time off again was a bit awkward. So I was just keeping it under wraps for a little while until I knew it was definitely happening. Um, I had to have my thyroid removed um, in February before I could do any training. I had a very um, very overactive thyroid. Uh, it took a while to be diagnosed to figure that out, so that had to be taken out. And as soon as that was done, I got back into to training. Um, got a new coaching team together, an amazing coach in the US, uh, Mike McCastle, and then one here in London, Joel Proskovitz. And um, uh, oh, they're such incredible coaches. They're never, ever going to get rid of me now. And uh, yeah, the training was a dream. It was just such a great time. Um, I've never felt as strong as I did. Um and it was a really great lead up to, to leaving again um, for the aim was another world record attempt. But I think what I liked that changed for me between the first attempt and the second attempt was the first one. I think I said I was hell bent on the world record. Nothing else would even interest me. And I remember Matt and family saying to me before I went, you should maybe have that as a secondary goal. <laughs> Like, you know, so many, so many things have to go right for you to get a record. And I know that. It doesn't matter. My, you know, super optimistic. This is going to happen. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Um, and that year, I actually spent a lot of time reframing. And the, the primary goal was just to make the South Pole. And the secondary goal would be to get get the record. And um, for me to say that and actually mean it, it was a huge um, win for me. And I think um, I think it's made me a better person, actually. I'm still very, very competitive, um, but it was nice to actually feel that if I just made the poll, I'd be genuinely happy with that and not get home and a month later be like, well, I was kind of lame. I think I could have done better and like really, you know, beat yourself up. Um, and so, yeah, it was about just just getting there. 
Um, but I, I trained so hard. I can't tell you the amount of hours I put into training. Training to me is everything because it's a way of controlling the controllables. There's so many things, especially if you choose to do expeditions in these environments that you have no control over. The way I kind of deal with that, if you like, is you control what you can and then the rest, it's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> what will be, what will be. So training, I never miss a session. It's everything. Um, and yeah, left in... I think it was about someone told me a friend message a couple of days ago to say, "Oh, this is the this is when you left to start um, the second attempt," and I wouldn't have known that. So yeah, it's like a year ago this week. God, and so sort of because yeah, you had eight months to do it. You landed in Antarctica, and then what was the sort of mindset you had for that trip? Because I imagine it was very different to the first attempt. Yeah, the difference is just what I, it was that I was going to get there and that would be enough. And if I got the world record, amazing. And that was so different from the first year where I was just like, no, if I don't get the record, then that's rubbish, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, it, was, it was very strange going to do the same thing again uh, because um, there were so many other things I had planned for that this year, that year. <laughs> So in some ways, like 10% of me was a little bit annoyed that I was going to do this again. Um, and also I thought Antarctica, I'll be going there once in my lifetime and that'll be it. It's such an incredible place, but it's so expensive to get to. I never thought in this lifetime I'd be there twice. So I had a little bit of guilt over that. And I think I had guilt as well because I know how many people want to do th things like this. I like might laugh, it's not a huge amount of people, but <laughs> people want to do this. And it's so hard to get the money together. It's what the all expeditions come undone because of it and um for me getting the funding for the second time was really straightforward i called my sponsors and it was a case of we thought you'd never ask like we're so happy you're going back so it was really easy and it felt a bit a bit handed you know what i mean like i quite you quite i think you get a lot from fighting for it and having those failures like oh that person's not going to sponsor me after all that company isn't and oh this isn't working like, all those things and this time it was like yeah here you go and that was really odd. There was no fight. Um, and I was a bit worried, is that going to take away from my performance? I mean, nonsense, it didn't. Um, but yeah, it was a bit of a different mindset. It was a more grown up mindset, I think, actually. Um, it was probably a bit ridiculous to, you know, have your, your primary goal as being the world record. But that's the way I was. Um, yeah, so started. Uh, it was amazing. The weather was normal. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is normal Antarctic weather. Um, there was a couple of big storms, but I was like, these are fine. I'm, I'm skiing through them. And I was ahead of the world record pace by nearly two days, um, all the way until things started going wrong. <laughs> As they inevitably do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A couple of things went wrong, but really the main, you know, the, what led to everything going wrong was, was the leg. Um, so I had a... Um, a condition called polar thigh, um, mostly on my left inner thigh. And that is it's fairly common amongst um, more women than men actually doing really long polar expeditions. And um, there's a lot of, or there was rather, doctors kind of a bit unsure about what causes it and why. Um, but really the best explanation we have for it now is it's kind of like a severe chill blame. And obviously staying in the cold makes it progressively worse um, and as the skin is trying to heal, uh, so basically I jumped a, st um, miss a blah, step. What happens is you have these ulcers on your leg. They're very small to begin with, and then they basically start to grow. So you're like, oh, that doesn't look that great. I'll just cover that up. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the reason they kind of keep growing, if you like, is they have uh, what doctors call a reperfusion element. And so as the blood flow is going back to the air to try and heal, it actually causes more inflammation, more area gets damaged, and it keeps growing. Um, so there's pictures of my injury um, on the on my Instagram account, and they're they're pretty horrible. <laughs> and you can kind of see how. So they started off being really small, and I only had one little sheet of granny flex, which is a kind of dressing we use on big expeditions, where you can just quite thick. It's like a slab of dressing. Uh, you peel it off, whack it on, and that's not going to go anywhere until you kind of finish, get home, and you've had a long shower. Um, and I was running out of that. I was like, <laughs> so my leg looks a bit like a patchwork quilt near the end. Um, but everything came undone. I had a really, really benign fall in a whiteout 
um, fell over nothing. And as I landed, I heard and felt all the ulcers crack open, basically split open into one big leg wound. And it was it was absolutely horrific. Um, I've never heard a noise like it. And I lay there, you know, just looking up at nothing. It was a white eye and just crying. I mean, it was the most amount of physical pain I've ever been in. And then at that point, I think I had about 100, 150 miles to go, something like that. And it was like, wow, I, I, I'm still going. And at that point, it went from skiing really well. I mean, everything was going so well. Like I said, I was ahead of the world pace world record pace um and suddenly i'm skiing and dragging a leg behind me um sorry i don't think i explained at the beginning i've got a huge sled behind me with my tent all my food supply absolutely everything i could need so that's not light and um suddenly dragging this leg and it 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 just became so so difficult even things like putting the tent up and down which in high winds is a fast speedy job you've got to be on it and um, there's lots of kind of, you're up, you're down, you're putting snow here, and building snow walls there. And trying to do that with my leg open like that was awful. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> there was, I was never, ever stopping. That never, ever entered my mind. Um, I moaned a lot to, so my dad is the expedition manager. And so I could, there's a way of sending sort of text messages from Antarctica using the Garmin inReach. And I'm very, I don't, I'm not in comms with a lot of people because it takes too much time. So it's just Matt and my dad. And I swear every message was just my leg. I'm in so much pain. You don't understand. And then I'd apologize for moaning so much. Um, I, I still don't know how I did it. I don't. Um, I had a very few uh, painkillers left. And these were painkillers that were uh, in my emergency bag. And they were in case I fell down a crevasse, broke a shoulder and I'd be medivaced and they were to pop and take while I was waiting for the helicopter or whatever. They were not meant to ski with just to help your leg get to the South Pole. Um, so I couldn't take them during the day because on a solo expedition, it's just you and you need to have your wits about you for navigation, for you can't be completely out of it. Um, so I would take them at night um, until I ran out. And then I remember actually, because uh, you decant everything into a really lightweight bag. So my painkillers were all in a little labeled um, uh, like food bag, snack bag. And I remember sitting there licking the inside of the bag (laughs) to get the very last remnants of painkiller. And, um, yeah, it was horrific. I arrived at the pole. And the day that I saw the pole when it came into sight, I knew that it was still very, very far away. Um, And I probably should have stopped and camped between between the two places. I didn't. I skied for 19 hours straight. Um, For the last four or five hours, I didn't stop for for a drink or food. I was just like, I'm getting there. This is this is it. Got there at about two in the morning at the South Pole, met by the South Pole um, guide, uh, camp manager, rather, Dev. And he handed me a beer. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, it was it was very, very strange. For for people listening, what is it like at the South Pole? Um, it feels mostly like a scientific base and you feel like you're intruding. I wouldn't say, um, so if you imagine there's, it's the American, um, scientific base is there, which is huge. And also I think very messy. I do remember thinking, God, you guys are untidy. There's all sorts of equipment just like littered, um, in their back garden, if you like. And I was really surprised they went more tidy, but anyway, um, and a little, then there's a South Pole right outside their, their base. Um, the kind of bar the pole that we all know and love and then maybe half a mile away from there is the I guess what you call the tourist camp which is tiny I think there's about eight tents maybe and then a slightly bigger tent where like a mess tent where you can come in and eat and play cards or whatever and that's where I'm allowed to be but there's very specific rules about where you're allowed to go around the scientific kind of base camp um, I wouldn't say it's the most welcoming place actually <laughs> Um, it was very, very cold. The sky looks very odd. Um, and sometimes I was convinced I could see curvature, which I obviously couldn't, but it was, it was just a very strange place to be. And I couldn't believe after all this time, I'm finally here. Um, but there was a doctor there. There isn't normally a doctor at the South Pole camp. Um, but I should explain, sorry, with my leg, every night um, when I was skiing with that injury, I would have to make a satellite phone call to the main base camp and speak to the doctors. Um, that was compulsory. 
Um, and every day they say, we need to medivac you, we need to medivac you. And as you know, I'm well versed in medivacs in Antarctica at this point. And there's no way I was being medivaced. And the reason being is I was not on well. I had no fever. There was no signs of infection in my leg. Like it's a very clean, sterile environment, Antarctica. And so I, I could not see the merit in being medivaced other than you, this is just going to get worse until you get out of the cold. And I decided I didn't, I didn't care about that. Um, and I also thought my leg was getting better. So it kind of makes more sense if you can see the first photo of my leg um, with what I call the patchwork quilt. It's got all the little um, patches of granuflex dressing. And in between that, you can kind of see uh, it's dried blood. But I, hand on heart, was absolutely convinced that that was scabbing, healthy scabbing. So it's getting better underneath this dressing. That's my mindset. Um, I now know, because when I got back to the UK, I was in hospital with it they brought in a sports psychologist and she explained that that was my, I was so, I told my brain that we were going to the South Pole. So my mind was just making stuff up. So my mind to me, that is scabbing and it's getting better. And that's absolute nonsense. Like if you look at the picture, it's clearly not that. Um, and I, I was, I was just getting there no matter what. Um, and yeah, so there was a doctor waiting there at the South Pole because I repeatedly refused to be medevaced and they needed to take a look. Um, it was kind of luck that he was there, though, to be honest. And um, he took a look at the leg the next day. And him and Dev, who was helping bandage my leg, they couldn't remove any of the granuflex. You need a hot shower to do that. There's no showers at the South Pole. So they just covered it in big, comfortable bandaging just to keep me cosy. And I was put on a diet of morphine and beer until we could fly out of the South Pole. And you can't just leave the South Pole. There used to be a clear weather window at the South Pole and the main base camp. And it's like a, I think it's a four-hour flight in between. It's a long way. I mean, Antarctica's huge. So we were there three or four days, and I was high the entire time. Um, I don't remember much of it. I do remember getting fed up with being high. <laughs> but they were just trying to keep me comfortable and also doing anything to avoid infection. I'm now around other people. I can't get leg infected. Um, but what I do know is that um, when they first looked at my leg, they both, the doctor and Dev, recoiled at the smell. So you can see this in the second picture. Um, there's a big area of black tissue um, once they removed the granuflex. So that is necrotic. It's completely dead tissue. Um, and apparently it stank something. Obviously it didn't smell nice. It's rotting tissue. I did not smell that once. And the sports psychologist again explained that is your mind saying this, there's no smell there. There's nothing wrong with this leg. We're going to the South Pole. And I think the power of the mind there, once it was explained to me that way, that's just, it just blew me away. Um, and no one could believe I couldn't smell it. And I would get my nose right into it. And they'd be like, oh, God, Jen, how can you not smell that? And I just couldn't. Um, so, yeah, I had a great time at the pole. I drank beer, drank whiskey, kept taking so many painkillers. Eventually, we flew back to the main base camp uh, where I was put in a shower. Uh, and that was a really traumatic experience for me, um, peeling off that granny flex. And a lot of this doesn't make sense until you see the pictures, but peeling those bits off in the shower. And in the shower, I had, instead of where the shower gel was, uh, they gave me a bottle of whiskey. And doctor's orders was just keep sipping that whiskey. This is not, this is going to be awful. Um, and he fed me um, <laughs> painkillers through the shower curtain. Uh, people said I sounded like a howling animal, and it was it was very very difficult. I was in a lot of physical pain. And then um, yeah, then we waited for the flight home. There was no urgency around at this time because I was fine, other than my leg. I wasn't unwell. And again, <laughs> so they just kept me drunk and high <laughs> until I could go home. Um, went straight home thanks to BA um, to Heathrow. Husband meets me at the airport and um, he's a plastic surgeon. And so he would normally do this operation on my leg, uh, but couldn't, didn't fancy operating on his wife. So his colleague did it. But the weird thing in the airport when I saw him, I haven't seen him in a long time. It's very exciting. Is he's like, we're going to the hospital right now. They're waiting for you. And I was like, what, dude, come on. No, I, I, and I knew I needed to go to a hospital but to me, I'm just still in the mindset I'm explaining of I can't smell anything. I think it's healing. I thought um, they needed to replace the bandaging since I was on the plane. 
and I also believed um, they just wanted to have a look. It's very rare to see polythi. It's not very common at all. I did not realise that I needed surgery at all. I thought I thought Matt was crazy. Um, get to the hospital. They have a meeting about my surgeries. Meanwhile, I've eaten two packs of crisps and two chocolate bars. <laughs> and they come out and say, we're going to operate on you immediately. And they couldn't because I just stuffed my face with all that food. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm rambling on now, but then um, I had to have two operations and um, one to remove all that dead tissue, all the black bits and the horrible bits. Second one was a big skin graft, um, which took, I think 60% of it took. Uh, recovery was really long. I had to go back to hospital every one or two days to get the dressings changed. And I didn't look at my leg for maybe six weeks. Um, the psychologist really encouraged me to. And I just couldn't. I thought, I know it looks horrific. I can tell from people's reactions. And I think I'd rather see it once it's slightly more healed. And then surely it's more palatable to me. Um, and the psychologist was amazing. I got really bad flashbacks to the shower in Antarctica. So getting to a shower at home was really scary. Um, and I, I didn't like, I felt quite powerless over that. And I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't a case of like, Jen, just woman up, like you're fine. It's just a shower. It was, it was a really big deal. Um, not for long, maybe about two weeks. And I also kept having these recurrent dreams in the hospital. And I was in the hospital for about a week and a half and at home where the entire ward would turn into a huge storm in Antarctica. And I could see the pole. It was like a couple hundred yards in front of me. So I'd been on the road for, it took me 44 days in the end. So I'd been going for a long time. And Father Christmas just stepped out and was like, oh, you can't go to the pole. It's closed today. Sorry. <laughs> You need to go, you need to go home. Or a, a different iteration each time, but someone preventing me getting there. Um, and again, psychologists explain that's to your brain now catching up that you actually made it and you're home. And it hasn't quite processed that yet. And so you're still getting this like fear that you're still there and haven't made it yet. Um, so in some ways, all of that was quite a big deal. In some days, some ways it wasn't. Um, I lost no function to my leg, which was huge to me it's the first thing I asked um after both my operations when I woke up all groggy was like have I lost any function and if I'd lost function I don't know what state mentally I'd been in I'd have been really really upset because I my injury didn't need to be this bad this is purely me wanting to complete something uh but there's no loss of function there's just a very very big scar <laughs> it's an incredible story and as a you, you show incredible determination and drive to sort of push through the sort of pain barrier. And as you said, that sort of mentality. Have you always had this drive and this determination? From Were you always ultra competitive growing up? Not really growing up, but definitely, you know, those kind of lost teenage years where I was just, didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> just kind of figuring life out. It wasn't like that then. Um, I think... Once I started getting into ultra running, and first of all, it starts with a half marathon, then a marathon, then a longer marathon, you start to think, wait a minute, all these kind of limitations I'd placed and what I assumed I could do were absolute nonsense. And then suddenly you're doing like 400 mile races, and that seems insane. And then someone's like, well, have you heard about this 500 mile race? And you're like, well, hold on. <laughs> um, no, I haven't always been super competitive. Um, not in my younger years, but as an adult, definitely. But only ever with myself. I don't play the comparison game with anyone um, I care about what I'm doing, what I'm getting up to. Um, so, no, I don't. But I've forgotten the question now. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, um, hold on. Um, I do remember what it was. Yeah, so the, the drive and determination aspect of it, um, I've always known that is definitely in me. Like, if I say I'm doing something, I mean it, and it's going to happen. And I will organize my life, my lifestyle, everything to make it so. Um, but what spooked me about this expedition is I did not know that I had the mental strength, is it strength, I don't know, to push through that level of pain. And some people think that's amazing. I think that's a bit scary. <laughs> yeah. And something, yeah. something that needs to be kept in check a little bit because I, I think I said this earlier on, but I've, I've, I've done events where I'm a huge amount of physical pain had a broken bone but I run through it. I can I can put the pain somewhere else in my mind and it, it must be adrenaline as well you're doing a race and then when it ends like you feel the injury tenfold and you deal with it then um, and when I was younger especially I would train through injuries didn't care just keep going keep going and um, now I'm older I don't do stupid stuff like that but I definitely used to I didn't care if I was in pain 
but being able to carry on skiing with that leg wound that's crazy to me <laughs> um and so I knew I had that mental strength there but I'm I think it's something to it's good that I'm aware of um but yeah you definitely there's a balance you've got to keep that in check a little bit because it might not end that way next time did you get into ultra running um after your cancer diagnosis uh, yes, yeah, so it wasn't. It wasn't cancer, and um, oh, they sorry. they treated it very aggressively because it was so large they couldn't do any biopsy of it. And so um, I was given a, a strong form of treatment to shrink it in size, which made me really sick. And then they operated on it um, from the hospital uh, in London. Um, I signed up to my first ultra from there, and I'd never done anything like it. I signed up to the marathon de Sab from bed, and uh, I don't remember doing it um it was like the day after my surgery and so obviously I I was put on a waiting list I didn't automatically get a spot I think it was only like it would have been just for Christmas and the races I think in April or something I can't remember um and it was a yeah I got home and then at Christmas I remember my I got an email one day from someone called Sarah saying congratulations you've got a place on the marathon de Sab, you're on the waiting list and the spots come up and I was like what the hell and I was like, oh, my God, I do remember something about that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is a sign. I've got to do it. So I just I, you know, paid the deposit and that was it. Uh, but that was my first uh, foray into really long distance. I've done marathons before that, but nothing like big ultras. Do you think that um, diagnosis, though, was a sort of kick in terms of you to pursue these adventures? It definitely was. And it was it's come back to the job I was doing at the time, the hours I was working. And it was like, I mean, I never, ever believed um, that it was going to be a cancer diagnosis. Um, a lot of family and the doctors are very worried about me, but I just, I didn't feel unwell, I guess. Maybe you don't. Um, a lot of people say they don't, so, but I just didn't believe there was anything wrong with me. I just needed to get through this. But I still had, more, you still are faced with life could look very different or it could be shortened massively. And so... What am I doing with my time? What matters to me? And it's certainly not earning a fortune as a lawyer. So, <laughs> Wow, God. And so uh, there's a sort of part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. And the first is, on your trip, let's say, to the South Pole, what was the one bizarre thing that you craved or missed from home? Um... So I don't miss anything when I'm away. I really don't. I don't miss things. I don't miss food. Like I love dehydrated food, um, which most people do not, but I adore it. And if I'm being really lazy and there's no one around to cook, I make a dehydrated meal for dinner. <laughs> I really do. Um, the one thing I remember craving a couple of times on this last expedition was being able to crawl into my own bed. That's all I can I just wanted to get into the bed, like preferably with the dog, and just be like cozy. And I think it is, it's when my leg was really, really painful. I just wanted my own. I do remember daydreaming about, oh, my duvet is amazing. Oh, and there's my pillow. Oh, it's such a good pillow. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't crave anything um, at all. In fact, I love getting away from everything. <laughs> so there's no cravings. Yeah. We, we uh, had Geordie Stewart on uh on episode four and he was saying he wrote his book about traveling the world and one of them was you don't quite appreciate it home until you come back to your own pillow this your own pillow is everything yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's the only thing i thought about was duvet my pillow um yeah <laughs> <laughs> I imagine with the uh, temperatures in the South Pole, must have must have really emphasised it a bit. Just wanting to hide, and yeah, it's, it's actually <laughs> quite warm in your tent in places like that. Um, because you have to remember, there's 24 hours sunlight, and so your your tent becomes this kind of sun trap. Not always, um, but yeah, it's not too cold in the actual tent. <laughs> <laughs> did, um, did you have like a favourite adventure book growing up? Um, so I'm looking at my bookshelf behind me, like, hmm, <laughs> which was my favourite. Um, what sort of books inspired your adventures? Oh, gosh, anything about the outdoors, like cycling around the world, mountaineering books, 
all the Ranulph Fine books. I mean, I've got all of them and I've read them all many times. Um, oh, The Race to the Pole with James Cracknell and Ben Fogel. Um, that was a five-part TV series as well as a book. And uh, it's on YouTube still. And I've watched that so many times. I find it comforting just having it on the background. Um, also, my husband's in it. But um, the my favourite book that I have read at least 10 times. And I read it both times before I went to Antarctica again is um, by Felicity Aston, who is, I think, the world's leading female polar explorer. Um, and it's called Alone in Antarctica. Uh, she was the first woman to do a full crossing in Antarctica. She's amazing. Um, and it's so beautifully written. She's such a great writer. Um, so, yeah, that's my favourite, favourite book. And if you read it, if you, if you haven't been to Antarctica, but you want to kind of understand what it's like, that book takes you there. Oh, like, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have an inspirational figure growing up? Um, I grew up in Borneo. And okay. um, there was a huge amount of poverty. And so I obviously knew that we weren't poor. We weren't on the poverty line. And... Um, I used to play with a lot of kids who lived in like the, we call them compounds, so kind of like the shanty towns next door to where we were. So we were there because parents worked for an oil and gas company. And so you're in a nice kind of estate, if you like. And then everyone else was next door, which I really struggled with as a kid. But they, it was the, the children that I played with in the rainforest or out in those um, shanty towns because we were always in there as kids we weren't supposed to be <laughs> but it was more fun <laughs> um they had nothing like really nothing and I had all these toys and I was like but they're just as happy as I am um and they like just growing up there everything about that place had a lasting influence on me um my mom has a remembers a story where I had a big birthday party all these presents given to me and mum and dad popped out for like 10 minutes and they came back and I'd given away all my presents over the, the fence. <laughs> They'd all gone. Um, I just really struggled with uh, having so much. Um, and I really, really struggled settling back into the UK. We moved back when I was 12. And um, I thought the UK was the craziest place ever. <laughs> I really didn't like it. Uh, I didn't understand why people cared about wearing branded clothing um, why they had so much stuff. And I, I find it really, really hard. But in terms of who's always inspired, it's, it's people like that that I grew up with um, because they had nothing. Oh, amazing. amazing. Um, do you have like a favourite quote or motivational quote? Yeah, I've got loads. <laughs> I actually write a lot of quotes on the inside of my tent, my expedition tent. Um, and one I've got in big um, so it's the first thing you see when you wake up on the roof of the tent in, inside um, is let routine take command of feeling. I can't actually remember who said it, which is really bad. It was someone in the polar community. I think it's Erling Kagi, actually. And um, it's basically no matter how you're feeling, you have a routine to follow. Because on polar expedition, any kind of expeditions, uh, especially long ones, the routine you have every day of I'm up at this time, takes 20 minutes to boil the water and eat. Then I'm doing this, then I'm doing this. I'm on the road by nine. You have to stick to that routine, especially when you're by yourself. Like if you and I went to do something together in Antarctica, if you were having a bad day, I'd be like, come on, dude, let's get going. You'd be like, okay, yeah. And you do the same for me the next day if I was low. But when you're solo, there's no one there um, to do that for you. So you really, really are independent in the, in the true sense of the word. So the routine becomes everything. It's almost like the rule book. Um, and so no matter how you're feeling, you don't want to get out of the tent, don't want to do this today. It's tough because there's a routine. So the routine is king. Um, and then also the number one thing was to never look outside the tent before you got up properly. Because if you saw there was a whiteout, you'd just be miserable getting ready and take like an extra 20 minutes. <laughs> it's going to be a oh, rough day. So I would never look until I, until I got outside. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. How did you find your routine in lockdown? Um, fine. A lot of people assumed I would struggle in lockdown and go a bit crazy. But actually, I had I really liked it because I had no pressure to do to say yes to things or be anywhere. And no one could make me because <laughs> you're not allowed. <laughs> That's against the law. Um, I definitely did have a routine, though. Um, I stuck to my training. 
Um, yeah, I didn't miss any training in lockdown. It was just doing it in the living room or on the bike indoors. So, yeah, the, the routine was just as important in something like lockdown when every day kind of became Groundhog Day a little bit. Yeah. And I suppose people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures. What's the one thing you would recommend them to get started? I always tell people to find yourself a mentor, um, especially if it's something that you think is pretty big or is quite new to you, or is maybe an area that not many people have been to. Um, find someone who's maybe done it before, and nine times out of ten, they're more than willing to give you a hand. Um, and help you out and I think like I mentor a lot of people who want to do things in Antarctica and it, you know the first phone call it's like well, I've just got this crazy dream I don't really know if it's possible and I think it just helps speak to someone he's like yeah, it's totally possible you just need to speak to this person you need to do this and da, 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 and just break it down it's like oh that's totally achievable and you're like yeah it's fine but when it when it's because I had the same I had a mentor um when I first wanted to do something in Antarctica and I think it's then your circle of friends or your family what you're suggesting to them as your little idea is absolutely bananas. Yeah. Yeah. And so you need to speak to someone who, no, that's, that's not crazy. Totally doable. And then you're suddenly like, Oh, you're standing up a bit taller. You're like, wait a minute, I think I can do this. Um, so I always say that. Yeah. Okay. And, um, what are you doing now? What are your sort of future plans with your adventures and how can people follow you? So, um, 2020 was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Everything from 2020 was moved to 2021. Um, the What I was doing next um, was rowing the Pacific, the team of three other women. Um, that was going to be next June. Um, but then something more exciting came along. So I'm currently pregnant. Um, and so a lot of things for next year have been cancelled. Uh, not cancelled, uh, rescheduled, related date, yeah. But the the one thing I do have in the diary for next year um, I've got a document, a filming a documentary at the moment, and then in um, October next year is the Adventure Race World Championships in Spain, um, which I'm in with a team of three others, and that's the um, the first ever all female team to take part part in the Adventure Race World Champs, which is very exciting. And so um, I've never ever trained for something like that with a newborn, but I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> God, well, good luck and sounds amazing. And how can people follow this journey? Uh, just on Instagram. Just on Instagram. Just on Instagram. Yeah, most straightforward way. Yeah. At Jenny, uh, Jenny Wordsworth. Wordsworth. Uh, yeah, Jenny dot Wordsworth. Jenny dot Wordsworth. Jenny Okay, amazing. Okay, amazing. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And uh, I'm sure, like everyone listening, it has been an incredible story. Just an unbelievable determination and drive. Please ignore the uh, smoke signal, smoke alarm going off in the background. But yeah, just a remarkable story. Thank you. Yeah, I do remember the last thing my surgeon said to me was, um, I hope you wear these scars with pride. Um, and I think I kind of do. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, they, as, as you were describing and the pictures show, it was uh, quite a horrific injury. Yeah, it's not not pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you so much. No, thank you.